So welcome everyone, uh, especially an especially warm welcome um, in light of the weather and the um, many travel difficulties that I know a lot of people had in managing to actually get here today. Um, so thank you very much for making the effort and for being here. Um, I have uh, a couple of announcements before we go for our first uh, group of fabulous um, introductory foundational um, speakers. Um, so uh, a couple of announcements just about the, about the program. Um, first of all, uh, logistical announcements. There was, there's information about the Wi-Fi. Oh, Nicole is right there, Nicole. Uh, this is Nicole, who's like been the one who's made it actually work. <laughs> the most important person for the conference, right there. So, uh, if you have questions about the Wi-Fi, there's information out there. If you have, oh, and it's on the back of the agenda. Um, if you have other, you know, questions about logistical sorts of things, Nicole is the person to ask, or anyone that's sitting out there at the desk in front. Um, I also wanted to say I'm, I'm welcoming, you, welcoming you here on behalf of the law school, but also on behalf of two of our centers. Um, and it's exciting for me to have something that involves these two centers, because I'm closely involved with both of them. Um, and one is the Engelberg Center on Innovation Law and Policy, uh, which does, like it sounds, things related to mostly innovation and IP, and the other is the Information Law Institute, uh, which does work relating to privacy and kind of all of the other things about information that don't uh, have to do with innovation and IP, roughly. Uh, I also wanted to uh, mention and point out the co my co-organizers for this event, which, who are Rochelle Dreyfus, right over there, who you'll hear speaking um, very soon, and Julia, where are you? Yeah, Julia Powell's um, over there, um, who is one of our uh, ILI fellows, however, soon to be leaving us for a faculty position in her, na her, her native Australia. Very great for her, <laughs> sad for us, <laughs> and happy. Um, okay, and then I don't want to take too much more time, but I just wanted to mention that we have a couple of substitutions on the program, um, most of which are actually in the program because Nicole managed to make these changes like on the fly yesterday. Um, so they're in the program. Um, but I wanted to particularly thank uh, Pauline Kim. Unfortunately, was unable to make it despite trying several flights. They didn't come. Um, so she will not be here in session two. But Ari Waldman, who is the moderator for session two, has kindly agreed to uh, talk to us for a few minutes about social robots in order, to, well, it's not the same topic, but an uh, equally interesting topic. And so thank you so much, Ari. And I also wanted to say we're really grateful to Natalie Ram, who's going to be presenting. Uh, this is also like we called her. We called her yesterday. Hey, Natalie, you want to do this? Um, besides being on the panel that she was originally supposed to be on, she's going to talk about. She's going to substitute in for Andrea Roth in the third panel about forensic evidence and the court. So, really th gr great thanks to all of you speakers and panelists, but especially to the people who kind of stepped up at the last minute in this way. Um, let's see, I think that's basically my announcements, unless anybody has logistical questions or things. Okay, great. So now I'm going to move on. I'm going to introduce the um, speakers from our first session. And the way I'm going to run, we're going to run this session, um, I think rather than having them all sitting up there, and this is selfishly me also, because they want to see each other's talks and presentations, I'm going to have them come up one by one. And then uh, we'll do the Q&A discussion at the very end, um, after all of them have had their chances to present. Um, so let me um, introduce, I think I'll introduce all three of them now, and that'll make less, uh, less, transaction, <coughs> less transaction costs going forward. Um, and I, oh, this was the other thing I also wanted to say. We're going to keep the introductions minimal for the speakers, not because we don't appreciate all of our fabulous speakers. We do. Um, but because we do appreciate them, and we want you to hear from them rather than from us. But there are links to all of their bios on the version of the agenda that is on the website. Um, and if you haven't found it, you, you can Google NYU ILI trade secrets, and it'll it'll come up for you then. Um, oh yes, is Nicholson. this a <coughs> secret meeting, so to speak, or are we no. tweetable? Or yeah, no, it's tweetable. <laughs> <laughs> Not secret. Uh, good question, though. Very good question, especially for someone who does privacy blog. <laughs> Very important question. Okay, so our 
Our uh, first speaker um, in this session is um, Gina Matthews, who is a, um, who's going to speak about decision-making algorithms. Um, Gina is a computer science professor uh, at Clarkson University. Um, and she's done a lot of fabulous things that you'll see when you look at her bio. I just wanted to mention um, sort of the reason that I know Gina um, is that she is working on um, comparative studies of DNA forensic software, uh, which actually is part of something I'm working on in the project I'll talk about later. Um, and she, she and, and her collaborators recently received this Magic Grant Award um, to study this. And this is incredibly important work, so I think we should all be grateful to them for doing it. Um, and she does lots of other things. She's involved with, uh, very involved with the ACM's um, public policy work and so forth. So that's Gina. She'll be the first speaker, um, and I'll have her come up in just a second. But before that, I'll introduce our next two speakers, who are both of whom are my uh, colleagues here at NYU. Um, Rochelle Dreyfus, who's right over there, and will speak um, second, is going to uh, give us an introduction to trade secrecy law and policy, and there's probably no better person you could possibly have to do this, so you are all lucky. Um, she teaches uh, trade secrecy, patent law, international law, um, various things related to innovation, law, and policy here at NYU, um, and also does many other fabulous things you can see in her bio. And then after, uh, after that, we'll have Jason Schultz to give an overview of the issues about secret algorithmic systems that we'll be delving into in detail throughout the next two days. Um, Jason is uh, a clinical professor here at NYU, um, and he directs our fantastic technology, law, and policy clinic. Um, also, uh, Rochelle and Jason are both co-directors of the Engelberg Center. Um, and Jason is also uh, affiliated with the AI Now Institute. So with no further ado, I'm going to ask Gina to come up and tell us about, teach us all about algorithms. Good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, I need to, can we start up the slides? <coughs> So as Kathy said, I'm a computer science professor. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that one, there you go. And maybe push the full screen display choice. There we go. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm a computer science professor, um, but I spent the last year on uh, sabbatical with uh, the Data and Society Research Institute here in Manhattan. And as part of that, um, I ended up doing a lot of work with lawyers. Um, so I've been, uh, I've been enjoying being part of your communities <clears throat> more and more often. Um, this morning I'm gonna talk about decision-making algorithms. So big decisions about the lives of individuals are increasingly made in a complex partnership between human decision-making and computer systems and in many ways, it's fundamentally changing the societal decision-making processes that we rely on, and it, oftentimes without discussion. Kind of things are being automated, and some of the fundamental principles that have always underlied the way we think we make decisions are changing. And that's true in criminal justice, hiring, housing, credit, news amplification, elections, everywhere. And especially here in this uh, uh, two days, we're gonna be talking about an, in an environment dominated by trade secrecy, what will be the incentives for improvement, for debugging, for fairness, for respect of the fundamental societal principles we think that we are upholding? So since I'm doing an introduction to decision-making algorithms, I'm gonna start with what is an algorithm. An algorithm is an unambiguous specification of how to accomplish a task. So step-by-step -step instructions, you can think of it as a recipe, that's a kind of common sense -y type definition. So if we're gonna have an unambiguous specification, like what? Could be a set of written instructions, like a recipe um, intended for humans to follow. It could be a flow chart, it could be a statistical model, it could be a computer program, a set of source code. It could be a machine learning trained um, uh, model. The point is that it is no longer ad hoc and unspecified. So you have a specification, and 
Then you have to ask, how is this algorithm implemented? How is this specification implemented? It could be implemented because humans follow directions. It could be implemented in software. It could be implemented as a hardware device. It could be, a, as I said, a complex partnership among all of these types of pieces. But in general, the more complex the algorithm is, the more you'd kind of like some hardware and software support to do that for you, rather than manually stepping through all of those things. And that's how we get automated systems or automated decision making. It's worth taking a minute to ask, where did the specifications come from? Not just how they're implemented, but how did we learn this recipe? Who said this was the right recipe? Um, it could be that the system designer or developer implemented it with their own belief about the way, what, what should be correct. It could be that they learned rules from domain experts. So they, they went out and they sought out experts in a particular field and they studied how these people make decisions and they wrote software based on that. Or it could be specifications that are learned automatically from patterns of data. And we see that increasingly where machine learning algorithms are ingesting especially big tr data train, you know, big data sets, often with a lot of personally identifiable information. And they're looking for patterns in that data or patterns in these facts about the world. But even in this case, it is typically that we are really fundamentally learning from humans. Whether it is looking at manual classification of training data, and I'll give some examples of that, or whether it's past, you know, data on the past that reflect how humans have made decisions um, leading up to, okay. So what would be an example of a typical classification process in, in machine learning? Um, these are some pictures of digit recognition, for example. Say that's a, that's a classic toy problem in, um, in machine learning. Imagine you have handwritten digits but, and you want to learn how to recognize a handwritten digit correctly when you see it. And um, you might have a data set of many handwritten digits and you might divide that data set into pieces. One piece, you say this is going to be our training data. We've gone through and humans have, have labeled um, these handwritten digits according to the number they believe is, is, is present. And then rather than coming up with a set of rules like, you know, uh, sevens have a strong horizontal at the top or eights are all about the curves or, you know, whatever you would like to, you know, you might as a person think about the rule for identifying these digits, you simply put the labeled data um, as facts that the machine learning system will ingest and try to learn, let it learn how to classify it on its own. And the second set of images there are actually some explanations of a machine learning system's, um, uh, pa the way it would, would classify digits. Does that seem incredibly helpful or like an explanation that you're like, oh yeah, I totally understand how it's doing that? <laughs> Not exactly. Um, and uh, interestingly, I, I love this example on the bottom. Um, this one might make a little more sense. So imagine, imagine instead of recognizing digits, you wanted to distinguish between dogs and wolves. So you had a bunch of photographs of dogs and wolves, and you did the same thing. You had humans go through and label um, them as dogs or wolves. And then you allowed the, the machine learning system to ingest those facts and try to figure out the pattern. In this case, it did provide an explanation. It highlighted the pixels in the photo that were used to make the classification. And here, what you see is that it's highlighting the snow. Okay, so um, could you imagine that being the outcome, right? Uh, if you're in the snow, you're a wolf, and if you're not in the snow, you're a dog. Clearly, that is an artifact of the training set. It's an artifact of a coincidence, a correlation, not a causation. But as I like to say, we are all going to be dogs in the snow, right? 
We are all going to say, you know, I am not a wolf. It doesn't matter whether I'm in the snow. Please listen to me. And the question is, one, will we even know certain sets of decisions are being made about us so that we even have a chance to dispute them? And even if we figure out that they're being made and they're being made incorrectly and we want to dispute them, will anyone care? Um, often, uh, the, the way the, you know, the socio-technical controls around these systems are being developed, I think it's very likely that no, people will not care unless we do something more about it than what we are doing. Um, I also want to point out that in systems like this, what we are doing is we are learning from the past. So if instead of you know, trying to recognize digits or dogs and wolves, what if we were trying to recognize who would be a good computer programmer or who would be a good CEO or who we should lend money to or um, these kinds of questions, we might not exactly look to hum you know, manually human labeled data. It's not like maybe a person went through and said, you know, good CEO, bad CEO, good CEO, bad CEO. But what you might do is take a bunch of data about people who are CEOs now, and you might say, well, okay, just by the facts of the world, these people have been labeled CEOs, so let's learn what patterns correlate with CEOs. Mm -hmm. Would that be a good predictor of the future we want? The, the, the past is the way, we might as well learn from the past because it's all we have. But if we forget to be very skeptical of the decisions or to think of them in light of the, the you know, unjust patterns that have gotten us to this point, if we, if we drive from the rear view mirror, then we will go in a direction different than the future we might actually want. And what's especially harmful is if we put things like that in a black box and we say cool, logical, unbiased decisions, nearly infallible decisions made by computers. Then we cease to question, we cease to be properly skeptical and we almost entrench the past as what the future will be. Um, I, I find it interesting that most people think of artificial intelligence and machine learning as very futuristic, the future. But I think in many ways it's the perfect enforcer of the past, the perfect enforcer of the establishment situation. And especially if you forget to embed them again in a larger socio-technical system with proper accountability, transparency, skepticism, um, we're not going to get the world we want out of this. I'm trying. There we go. Ah, like too many. All right. So we have an algorithm. That's a fancy word. That sounds really technical. And again, that kind of like the myth of, of almost infallible decisions by computers, infallibility of science. You know, just when I use that word, it doesn't mean that it's correct. It just means that we have a specification that is no longer ad hoc, right? Um, and how do we want to define correctness? Is it enough to say that an implementation that follows the specification is correct? Well, that is potentially one definition of correctness, but what if the specification was incorrect or didn't account for certain cases? What should be our other metrics? I mean, accuracy of prediction, many times when we're talking about decision-making algorithms, we're talking about predictions about the future, predictions about individuals. They will or will not be good at something. They will or will not repay this. They will or will not commit another crime. Things like that. You certainly could, in some cases, look at the accuracy of your prediction. And we should be doing that. If we are failing to, to you know, feed back data, um, collect and feed back data on when we've been wrong, that's a big problem. But another problem is that by the nature of the decision, we fundamentally change, change the possible outcomes. For example, if I don't keep someone in jail, I can see whether they commit another crime when they're released. But if I send someone to jail, then I can't know whether they would have committed another crime if they had been raped. Same kind of thing. I can look at who I hire. I can't really look at who I didn't hire. May, or maybe I could, maybe there's some ways. 
I could, I could look at what other career paths they followed. I think we need to be very, um, th this would be a good place to innovate, is to work on more feedback loops into the system. Uh, and also just looking at the impact on society. I think we often take a magical uh, technological wand and um, implement systems, and even systems that are done in like an accountable, transparent, considering all the stakeholders kind of way, can have horrible impacts on actual people in society. Um, I, I, I would recommend Virginia Eubanks' book, in, uh, um, Automating Inequality, as, as a, a place good to look at that. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and okay, so let's imagine we were able to define correctness, but consider the fuzziness of defining correctness that we just talked about. Um, it's, it's one thing to say whether or not it is correct for a particular case. It's completely different to say, is it correct in all cases? Um, and pretty much complex systems are not all correct. It's, almost, it's impossible to get them to the point that they are all correct. So it's more a matter of what are we gonna do about that? Are we gonna put it in a black box and deny it? Or are we going to enable iterative improvement? Um, another good question is, are people even capable of determining whether it's correct or not? So I've been working a lot with probabilistic genotyping software that compares DNA um, samples from a crime scene to DNA from potential suspects. And the kind of questions that are asked by the software systems are questions that are difficult to be answered by manual analysts. So, and that is often the case with these really complex software hardware systems. We've put it into a zone where even experts can't determine whether it is correct, whether the output is correct for any definition of correctness. And then you have to ask, you know, not just experts, but the people being decided about, or the public, a judge, uh, you know, people on a jury, um, you know, a journalist, you know, who is, what kind of background would you need to be able to determine if something is correct? That's a pretty high bar if even experts um, in something cannot. And that leads to the, the question of what is understandable, what is explainable, and to who? Um, in some sense, systems that have step-by-step -step source code instructions, releasing the source code would be a method of explanation, but it certainly wouldn't be an explanation to everyone. <laughs> There's a lot of people for whom that would be just as opaque as, uh, you know, as, um, as without that. So we have to invest in more ways of explainability. And um, I want to return to this idea, you know, we've been talking about correctness, I want to return to this idea of bugs, problems. So what is the relationship between complex systems and automated systems? I already told you that the more complex it is, the more likely you're going to automate it because it was just incredibly painful to do it as a person. It is not just automated systems that have bugs. Complex systems have bugs. Automated systems have different classes of bugs. And anyone who uses them knows this. As a citizen of the modern world, I am sure you have experienced software that crashes or that does completely unexplainable things for you that it doesn't do for any of your friends or neighbors. And um, you, but we have this belief that the system will get better over time. Maybe it's buggy, horrible beta software, but people will report problems that will get better, right? Uh -huh. Not necessarily. In any particular place where you're using decision-making algorithms, you better ask yourself, what are the incentives for debugging? Is there any incentive for debugging or iterative improvement in this system. And for example, I, I'll elaborate this on in, uh, in, in a little bit, but in criminal justice, for example, um, you know, if every time you report a bug, the answer is you're just complaining because you're guilty, that does not seem like a recipe for ever getting better. Um, so I would argue that you cannot be correct without transparency, and you cannot be correct without iterative improvement. There will always be cases that you didn't consider always, new cases that come up, right? New cases that were unexpected. And in a world where we take these complex systems that will have bugs and we put them in black boxes protected by intellectual property you know, um, claims, uh, which often, I think, are used to keep away legitimate concerns about correctness. 
not just to defend against people potentially taking your ideas. I'm sure that's part of it. Don't get me wrong. I get that. That's part of it. But it, it can also and is often used as a way to say, don't look, don't question. We are fine. We're good. We did our little validation study. Um, you know, the people who had a vested interest in proving this is, is good and working, we did, you know, a hand wavy thing. It's correct now. Never look again. That cannot be a recipe for a world we want to live in. Or DeWitt clauses in terms of service documents that are used to stifle reporting of problems or anti-reverse engineering that's used to prevent thorough to third party testing. This is not a recipe for complex systems that can benefit society and individuals. It is just not. Um, this is a lot of words on this slide. But what I want to get to is that you have to look at the interests of developers of complex automated systems, the interests of humans who are involved in making decisions, and the interests of people who are being decided about. You can also add to that the interests of the public good. And those very often are not the same. They're not aligned in any way, shape, or form. Um, there are often rare cases that matters to individuals. Like I said, if my software is crashing, it matters to me. If I don't get a job, it matters to me. I don't care whether that happens rarely. And it often boils down to the efficiency or reduced risk for deciders um, versus protections for individuals. And we have societal norms, laws you know, that say things like, you know what? It, yes, maybe the high-level demographic information, like race and gender or whatever, might be incredibly predictive or might help you manage the risk in your business, but you don't get to do that. It's illegal. You could consider that a tax on the efficiency of decision-making or risk reduction for, for, for people who are hiring or lending money or whatever. But what, what's happening with automated systems is we are putting them in place and we are forgetting to have this discussion about the balance of those things. There's almost starting to be an argument that any tax of that kind is inappropriate. That accuracy is what matters. And I would challenge that. Um, I think it's really important. I think increased efficiency of decision making is great. But you should be investing some of that savings in robust investigation of errors. And if you are not making your decision making processes transparent enough to people who have different interests, you are never going to get the resolution of the problems that matter to them. Um, and as I said, criminal justice is a perfect example of this. You ask, what are the interests of developers? Well, that's to sell their products and not, have, not to have to invest any more development energy and have it sell like hotcakes and, you know, are we done now? Like, just let, you know, send the checks. I don't have to keep, you know, investing in making this better. What are the interests of deciders? Um, maybe to appear tough on crime, maybe to um, uh, you know, reduce uh, risk. Um, but what, are, what about the rights of defendants to confront their accusers or the right to a public trial? You know, these are things that we say are, are rights, but are they still? If we basically replace decision-making process with automated black box systems that cannot be questioned, I'm not sure that, that it is. And I think in many cases, the debugging of these systems that should be happening in a very robust <laughs> way is being punted to individual defense teams, um, which are, uh, are heroically trying to fill that gap. <laughs> um, and in a way, they should still be able to do, but they should be able to use their resources to focus on the individual aspects of a case, not on the general trustworthiness of, of <laughs> automated systems. Um, OK. So if an algorithm is a specification, an unambiguous specification, what good is that specification if we lock it up in an automated black box and don't allow auditing or questioning, <laughs> right? You might want to uh, want to check the batteries on this one for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> Are, uh, can you help me maybe advance the slides? Okay. Um, so because uh, there's so many things I would like to say to you, and there's no way I'm going to have a chance to say them all, I'm going to point you to a few things that maybe you might want to read uh, that might. So this is an article I wrote with two folks from um, EFF. 
uh, opening the black box, defendants' rights to confront forensic software. And the article answers two basic questions. What types of review might attorneys and judges seek in understanding software-based or computer-based evidence? And what law and public policy require disclosure of these materials to the public and independent experts? I am not going to touch on the second one at all, but I'm going to quickly touch on the first. If we could um, go through these slides quickly. Could you help me do that? Forward one. Yeah. So. Uh, what some materials, certainly um, executables, getting your hands on the executables, being able to run many, many test cases, ideally with automated testing harnesses, which would be great if um, manufacturers had to supply, uh, that, that responded to uh, file, uh, common file formats and things like that. Okay, forward one. Um, be great to have access to source code. That is still a great way to understand systems. I will uh, warn you, again, about the machine learning automated systems often the, the secret sauce is in the training data and in the models and not really in the source code at all. But source code can be very useful. Okay, forward. Um, Else are things like, you know, from the, de the, de the development process, like design documents or testing plans and test results, experience with deployed software, things like bug reports or change logs. Forward again. Um, and um, as, as Kathy had mentioned, um, I've been part of a team for the last year or so on looking at algorithmic accountability and transparency specifically in the context of uh, probabilistic genotyping software, DNA, um, forensic DNA software. And it's a, it's a wonderfully uh, multidisciplinary team of, of lawyers and statisticians and journalists and computer scientists. And um, I will uh, forward one. I wish I had more time to talk about it, but basically what are the, some of the things we're doing? We're doing independent third party party adversarial testing and review. Just like the adversarial process is good in law, the adversarial process is good in technology too. You cannot trust the people who develop software to find bugs. Even if they want to, they have one mindset, they, they're not going to be thinking in all the ways that could break things. And also, they have a vested interest in showing that it's working, and those interests do not align with um, the people who are, the harm is, uh, who, who the system might harm. Um, automated testing harness, we're adding automated testing harnesses to systems so that we can do not just individual manual testing, but like large scale comparison testing. We're specifying common file formats and, and settings. We're doing source code analysis. And we're trying to come up with clear recommendations for judges, defense attorneys, and journalists. And also, um, we're trying to target the procurement phase of software, saying things like, here's a wish list of what I wish jurisdictions would do before they bought software um, of this kind. Okay, forward. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, I could recommend a talk we gave at DEF CON. I'm, a, I'm a really a computer security person um, who is thinking about securing not just computer systems, but socio-technical systems. And we gave a talk, uh, you're just complaining because you're guilty, a DEF CON guide to adversarial testing of software using the criminal justice system. And the YouTube video of that and the slides are available online. Okay, forward. Um, I also would love to um, uh, put a shout out for um, an upcoming article in AI Magazine, and also a talk I'm going to give at AI for Good, um, which basically, uh, it's a I'm doing AI for bad, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I'm pointing out, um, the, the, the title is Patterns and Anti-Patterns, Principles and Pitfalls, Accountability and Transparency in AI. I, uh, not all, it does talk about principles for doing it right, and things we could do to make it better, but it has 10 common anti-patterns. Um, things like, some of the things I've talked about already today, learning from the past without remembering the context, learning from humans without remembering human bias and the possibility of malicious training, using the data you have rather than the data you need, failing to measure the social impact of deployed systems. Uh, I'll just put a little teaser out there for that one. Okay, forward. So, okay, some final words. What do I hope we have done this morning? I, I hope that I've given you an introduction to decision-making algorithms that's helpful. It's always hard in a new group. Like, I don't know, I might have started too simple. Maybe I went too fast. Um, uh, if I can provide any other information that would be helpful to you, I'd be ho happy to do so. But I hope I've helped you think about hum it's not just whether it's automated or not. It's not just whether it's software. It's not just whether it's hardware. It's not just whether it's big data. It is the specification. It is the, co the, the complex system nature. Um, and uh, I want to really emphasize the importance of incentivizing iterative improvement. How did I get all those capitals in those last few bullets? I don't know, I went capital crazy, that's weird. Um, uh, <laughs> the importance of incentivizing iterative improvement. 
Complex systems have big bugs and unintended consequences. If we build a legal system, our socio-technical system around these that does not provide for transparency, iterative improvement, skepticism, we are going to be running our society on beta software and there's going to be a lot of people harmed. Who will not be harmed are the, the developers or the deciders. Who will be harmed is individuals and the public good. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that there is a fundamental trade-off sometimes between efficiency and risk reduction for deciders and protections for individuals. Where we have legal protections for individuals, we can't just like say, oh, we didn't hurt those when we automated this. It's still the exact same system we had before, it's just automated. Not true. If you put it in a black box like that, you don't allow questioning, cross-examination, skepticism, you put it in a box labeled, um, uh, you know, logical, cool, unbiased, nearly infallible decisions made by computer or automated system, we are all going to be living mm -hmm. with a lot of trouble. And I think we're doing questions at the end, so thank you very much. He's putting up my slides. I want to welcome all of you too. Join with Kathy and with Julia. Um, it's always fun to see actual people in flesh and blood after you've been emailing back and forth with them. And thank us especially for going through all the slush. Some of you are true heroes, and we really appreciate it. All right. So um, just as we had an introduction to decision-making algorithms, uh, we thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about trade secrecy, the policies they further, uh, the principal issues raised by this form of protection. Uh, I know that most of you don't need it, so I'm going to be fairly brief. Uh, so this is not a new right of action. Go forward. Um, the IP... Yeah, thank you. Uh, the IP historian uh, Lionel Bentley traces it to an English case, Newbury against James in 1817, uh, which involved Dr. James's fever powders, uh, a medicament that Newbury agreed to distribute on behalf of James, the inventor, and then later decided to distribute on behalf of himself. Uh, James sued, claiming that the information on compounding the powder was given to Newbury confidentially, and Newbury breached his duty to keep the information secret and use it only on behalf of James. Now James's claim was essentially about incentives. He had invested money and effort in developing the powders without the right to exclude free riders, like Newbury, who didn't make an investment. The price would be driven down, and he, James, would not be able to earn an adequate return on his investment. In the future, nobody would invest in making such advances. So that's the core policy underlying trade secrecy, create incentives to invest in innovative activities. Now, fever powders was a patent medicine in the most invidious meaning of the term. The court denied relief, possibly because it didn't want to create an incentive system to encourage the development of fraudulent materials. But it might have also denied relief because the fever powders were a patent medicine in the real sense of the term, too. James had tried to obtain a patent, and the court was worried about the relationship between that system and the ones that James was trying to create uh, in the development of the case. So after all, patents also create a right to exclude. They also furnish incentives to innovate, but they do it on condition that the inventor fully disclose the invention. That allows others to avoid, avoid wasting resources, inventing what's already known. Patent disclosures also enable other in innovators uh, to build on the, on the work and push it to the frontiers of knowledge. And importantly, patent disclosures facilitate regulation. It's hard to monitor and govern things that you can't actually see. Uh, but despite these hesitation, the law on trade secrecy grew. Uh, as my colleague Jeannie Fromer uh, has noted, an action for trade secrecy misappropriation was well understood in the United States by the late 19th century. Uh, it was a matter of state law. At first, state common law made by judges, later codified into the restatement of torts, uh, and by the mid-20th century, it was the subject of a uniform act which over time most states adopted into their statutory law. Forward. Um, yeah. 
So uh, here you can see the essentials of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. It protects information that's valuable because it's secret, is subject to reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy, and that it's taken by improper means, theft, bribery, espionage, or as in James's case, taken in breach of a duty to keep secret. Improper as opposed to proper means, proper means being independent invention or reverse engineering, figuring it out from an embodiment. Uh, in early cases, the use made of the secret had to be competitive, uh, used by a rival in the same business. But I put that in gray because, as we'll see, the focus on head-to-head -head competition has receded. Looking at the cause of action, one can discern some other justifications for trade secrecy protection, despite concerns about the social cost of secrecy. It protects against dishonest business practices, such as Newberry's absconding with the fever powder, or, or theft or bribery. In effect, it compensates innovators for the lead time advantage that the misappropriator cut short, and which would otherwise have allowed the inventor to earn a fair return. Trade secrecy also saves innovators the cost of protecting valuable information through egregiously expensive, as opposed to reasonable, for, uh, measures. Uh, for things like spending huge resources on multiple guards and guard dogs and huge physical barriers and sweeping factories. Uh, forward. Okay, good. Uh, in 1974, uh, Kiwani against Bicron, the Supreme Court dealt with the same question that the Newbury Court had faced more than a century earlier on whether trade secrecy conflicted with patent law. Uh, in the course of deciding that there was no conflict, the court added some other rationales. Trade secrets create incentives for discoveries in fields that fall outside the patent system or that are not inventive enough to merit patent protection. The court also thought trade secrecy was important as a way to facilitate dissemination. Trade secrecy holders can expand production because they can disclose information to funders, workers, distributors like Newberry, knowing that if one of these people takes the secret, trade secrecy law will be there to enjoin the use and protect the innovator's profits. Forward. Um, most important, the court believed that the rewards oh, great. Uh, of patent protection, now you've lost my place, um, uh, are so far superior to the rewards available by trade secrecy that it would be remote indeed uh, if somebody would keep a trade secret when they could patent it. Eugenie, but you were gone. <laughs> um, yeah, forward. There's no forward in this. Oh, oh okay. Um, presciently, Justice Marshall disagreed about that. He did not think it was remote, indeed, at all. Um, and he was right. Many modern inventions are easy to keep as trade secrets: manufacturing processes, computer code, uh, and algorithms, uh, along with all of the associated materials uh, that you just heard about. Uh, and quite a few modern advances do fall outside the patent system. Natural products, laws of nature, and importantly, abstract ideas, uh, including many algorithms. Moreover, for many advances, trade secrecy is better than patenting. Uh, patents are expensive to acquire and enforce. Patents last 20 years, but the trade secret can last forever, Coca-Cola supposedly. Um, to be sure, many secrets are discovered much more quickly, but in fast-paced industries where things change rapidly, 20 years of protection is often unnecessary, so why pay more for a patent if the trade secret lasts long enough? The result is that there's an increasing reliance on trade secrecy and considerable agitation to beef up protection. In 19... Next one. Uh, in 1996, Congress enacted... Uh, a federal criminal law, the Economic Espionage, the EEA, uh, and as with state law, it protects information that's valuable because it's secret, subject to reasonable measures to maintain secrecy. You can see this is a modern statute, so it includes high-tech materials, and punishes those who take it by improper means, 
uh, and also new methods of taking. Uh, and the law punishes even just receipt or possession. Uh, as I said, competitive use is no longer a requirement. Now, this is a criminal statute, so liability leads to fines or imprisonment or both. It doesn't help individual inventors all that much because the fines go to the government. Can you forward it? Um, sorry about that. Uh, violations are also prosecuted by the government, but prosecutors have considerable discretion uh, and they don't pursue sue every case. So can you go forward again one? Uh, so in 2016, a uh, new provision was added to the EEA, the Defend Trade Secrets Act, and that permits private parties to sue in federal court. Uh, and they can get injunctions, damages, uh, and sometimes royalties uh, if for some reason use is continued. Nonetheless, the concerns about trade secrecy have not gone away. The new rights of action make se trade secrecy protection an even more desirable alternative to patents than they were in Justice Marshall's day. And that's given rise to even more problems. Uh, because the main targets are employees who change jobs, trade secrecy protection inhibits employee mobility, it keeps salaries low, prevents talent from being put to its highest and best use. And then, of course, there's the subject matter of this conference, algorithmic accountability, uh, regulatory oversight over information systems that are making, as Gina said, all these tremendous impacts on our life. So today we will be discussing how to balance proprietary interests against social <coughs> concerns in this new legal environment. Uh, but before I turn it over to Jason, who's going to discuss some of those contexts in more detail, it's worth noting that this problem of balancing is not new and has been addressed in other areas with a variety of tools. So to give three examples, can you go forward? Um, there's a pure exemption. So for example, information generated by the government is generally available to the public under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, but there is a procedure that permits the government to exempt trade secrecy from any disclosure. Uh, second idea, go forward please, limitations on use. So the example here is data on the safety and efficacy of pharmaceuticals uh, and to some extent chemicals. It's very costly to develop this data. They're kept as trade secrets, but the information has to be turned over to regulators to clear the products for sale. But even though the government knows the data, it can't use it to clear rival drugs and chemicals for marketing for a fixed period of term. The innovator gets to uh, enjoy a period of data exclusivity. And then finally, ahead again, uh, limitations on disclosure. Uh, so in litigation involving trade secrets, courts can issue protective orders. Now this is a fraud is issue, especially in jurisdictions with very high thresholds for surviving motions to dismiss. Mm -hmm. But once that hurdle is overcome, protective orders can include preventing the secrets from being revealed, or they can permit, permit disclosure in a limited way. For example, the disclosure is sequenced, or records are sealed after litigation, access during litigation might only be to certain parties, just the judge or just the lawyers, or no one in a position to use the information competitively. So there are tools to deal with this tension between secrecy on the one hand uh, and incentives uh, on the other, um, or accountability on the one hand and incentives on the other. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion over the next uh, two days. Uh, there are three sets of issues that I hope we discuss. Uh, first, about incentives. To what extent is the trade secrecy incentive important to the development of algorithms? What role do first mover advantages play? What role for patents or for contracts? If it is about secrecy, what's important to keep secrecy? The algorithms, the source codes, the training material, the design documents, all the things that Gina talked about. What can be made available without endangering commercial interests? Second, countervailing considerations. What kinds of public oversight ought we to be thinking about? And then finally, if, tr if secrecy and, and oversight are the story, what tools can we recommend for balancing public and private interests in secrecy and in accountability? So thank you. Yeah. So 
Yeah, if you go full screen, then I can just point to you. All right, uh, thanks everyone for coming today, and thanks to uh, Kathy and Rochelle and Julia and uh, Nicole and everyone else for organizing this amazing event. Um, I'm really excited. This is something that has been a, a bee in my bonnet, as I know a number of you have been following this in the room and working on this for years and years. But for me in particular, um, when I first started uh, at my law firm way back in the day, uh, after clerking, um, uh, one of my first cases was a parallel patent case in federal court state case of trade secrets uh, in state court. And so litigating both kind of in parallel was this crazy immersive experience for me in some of these issues. Um, it was full commercial software litigation, so it was a very different context, but uh, I kind of, like the patent world seemed to become more dominant, and now the trade secrecy world, which has always kind of been there, it's sort of coming back. So for me, this has been an interesting journey. I wanna talk today um, about kind of some of the practical strategic litigation issues that are coming up in some of these. We've already heard some reference to litigation around these and questions and you know how do you deal with the trade secrecy issues. There's no way to touch on all of it, but I'm gonna highlight a few of them. Um, in particular, a few of them related to an event that um, uh, we pulled together last summer uh, here at NYU uh, with the ANOW Institute, which is a multidisciplinary research institute across all of NYU. Uh, the NYU Law Center for Race Inequality in Law and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the reason we sort of pulled the event together was because people were like, well, is this stuff in court or not? Are we actually litigating it where, how, when? So the event we did was very US centric because we were here, um, but we wanted to at least start with something. So we pulled together uh, six cases that we knew about that had either been uh, settled or decided or had some progress had been made and we asked essentially the lead lawyers and experts, technical, social science, and other experts if they wanted to come and just talk about their cases. Um, and so we did that and we published a report and I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's sort of the context of, of my talk today is to say sort of what were the things that came out of, of that um, convening uh, in that workshop. So as you've already heard, um, next slide. Um, uh, autom automated decision, secret algorithms, it's been something that's been covered this is from the Twilight Zone, of course, for telling the future, right? Nick of Time was the episode. Um, uh, and the idea of these systems, we've already heard from Jenna and others, is very um, troublesome. It's worth noting that secret algorithms have been around for a very, very long time in computing, uh, you know, Microsoft Word, Photoshop, everything from before that. Um, also, in terms of government surveillance and electronic surveillance and the Snowden disclosures, um, I'm not gonna be talking about any of that, but I think we have to like, keep all those things in the back of our minds if we haven't already. Um, on the commercial side, which I will also not be talking about, there's a lot of litigation going on in that. I think, in fact, that's the next domain for this where we'll be seeing a lot of this, um, where uh, the kind of uh, surveillance capitalism business model uh, and what people do with the data, we've seen this with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and trying to get to the bottom of like, well, how did this actually happen? And, Facebook is like, well, we can't actually tell you, it's a lot of secret sauce, or we'll tell you this much, or we'll tell you that much. Um, uh, in particular, for anyone who's following employment law and discrimination law around housing or um, employment discrimination, there are a number of complaints to the EEOC and lawsuits against Facebook around discrimination and its advertising um, that are happening right now, and I think we'll see some court decisions about what access the plaintiff's lawyers or the EEOC can get to uh, the trade secrets that Facebook is using in those contexts. In particular, um, the ability for advertisers on Facebook to select what groups, age groups, gender groups, uh, race groups, things like that, they want the advertisement to be shown preferably to. And also Facebook's, um, I think it's called a like me feature, or like essentially saying if certain people click on this ad, show it to other people who are like those people. So these are obviously a lot of trade secrets that are likely to get litigated. There is a connection to all of this um, because of the way in which they're sort of bundled together across domains. But today, I'm gonna focus on automated decision making in government. And what's been interesting is, for a lot of reasons, um, the first cases I think that are getting to some of these core issues, we've seen these in the criminal justice domain, but also in civil rights domains has been because um, there's this question of when do you know if your rights have been violated and then do you have standing to challenge and if so, when and how and where. Obviously, if you're being prosecuted, that's one place where you're obviously gonna wanna figure out what's gone on, but also in these civil rights contexts. So I'll be talking a little bit about how we even know that these algorithms are 
issues in our lives, and if once we know that there are issues in our lives, how do you go about trying to get more information um, in these contexts? Um, one quick. Um, I just clicked it, I think. So oh. I'm gonna try to see if okay, great. Um, <laughs> so one quick thing before, yeah, before you can stay here, but before this, I just want to mention um, that uh, there are also a lot of other barriers that we. Uh, recognize, I'm only going to talk about the trade secret barriers, but as many of you, I think, know, terms of service, breach of contract, inducement of breach, interference with business relationship towards the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and its state corollaries, um, even trade libel have come up in some of these cases, like you're defaming my good or service, uh, plus in the copyright realm, we have uh, claims of infringement for, you know, accessing code and for circumvention of technological protection measures under Section 1201. I'm just footnoting all that because I don't want to pretend like they don't exist. I will not talk about them today, but I think many of us are familiar with these. And this is when you get into the litigation, you see these things popping up in various places. Um, okay, so let me start with this slide here. Okay, so as I mentioned, we convened this event. Um, and I mentioned a little bit about uh, who we invited and we wanted to talk you know, with the folks who are interested in sort of challenging these algorithms in court. What are the strategy, how did they discover this? You know, who were the plaintiffs? How did the plaintiffs come to your attention? Uh, you know, how did you think about your strategy? What did you claim in your complaint? Um, we actually got a lot of the documents that were in the public uh, filings, and I can share those with anyone here. They're all public, part of the dockets. Um, but also, what, what, you know, what were the stages of litigation where you had to make strategic decisions? Um, you know, what evidence could you get without going to the court? Did you enter protective orders, as Rochelle mentioned? A lot of these things. So, uh, next slide. So the first case I want to talk about, and a lot of this has been in the news and things, so I'm just pulling from things that are very public here, um, was a, we had a series of case studies around cases involving health benefits, Medicaid, and other government benefits cases. So this is Tammy Dobbs. Uh, this is all from a, an article um, from The Verge, by the way, um, which I'm also happy to give a link to. Um, Tammy has cerebral palsy. And the story came about because she used to live in Missouri where her family cared for her, but then she heard about this state benefits program where uh, in Arkansas, and she was sort of thinking for whatever reason she wanted to move there, where the state would uh, provide uh, through a Medicaid waiver program um, a certain number of hours of care if you qualified and were assessed that you needed disability care in a certain number of ways. And in 2008, she moved there. And she signed up, and so a human nurse came, and they had a conversation, and she was assessed. And um, next slide, please. Oh, that, no, next one, yeah, that, perfect. So um, because Tammy, when she's waking and in her waking hours, spends most of her time in a wheelchair, and her hands are very stiff, she was determined to need a lot of care to just basic things, getting out of bed, getting dressed, getting out of the house, a lot of these things. And so they actually gave her the maximum number of hours under the program, uh, 56 hours per week. And it really allowed her, and the story, the Verge story goes into much more detail, to kind of like have as full a life as she probably could have had in the sense that the caretaker was sort of there for the waking hours. And then if she, and then it would sort of put her to bed and then get up with her in the morning. Um, and it really allowed her to have a lot of independence, a lot of self-esteem, a lot of the things that are hard to quantify, right? So going to what, you know, kind of can we quantify or not quantify. Um, fast forward, uh, next slide. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2016, the assessor comes, still a qualified nurse, but has a computer with her. I mean, they, she might have had a computer before, or he. But um, uh, starts typing in the answers to the same questions that they've always been asked. Questions like, um, you know, uh, how much help do you need to, to use the bathroom? What about eating? What's your emotional state like? And then afterwards, clicks a button and out pops 32 hours, down from 56 to 32. Here's your new benefit out of the system, right? So classic black box problem, because Tammy's like, well, what happened? Why is this different? And the assessor had no response. Had said, I don't know, the computer says, you know, computer says no, right? The computer says 32. And suddenly, that's Tammy's life, right? She has a little bit of a grace period, but like basically get ready for a huge cut with no ability to kind of get answers or understandings or even contest in any real way what was going on. And um, so, she went to the state and even tried to ask the state officials, you know, how this was different. And they said they didn't know because, of course, it was all automated through this algorithmic recommendation system, right, to help make the decision. And that they hadn't written it. They had been a contractor and all the things we know about software contractors and vendors and procurement and all these other issues, right? 
So fortunately, she got a hold of Legal Aid, um, um, a great lawyer there, uh, Kevin uh, Bilbon, who brought a case on, uh, actually, really the case that ended up getting litigated was on behalf of other people, but she was kind of in this pool of people that he started hearing from. In fact, at the event, Kevin told us, try to remember the exact numbers, but like the number of complaints about the program uh, I think went up tenfold about uh, after the algorithm was implemented. Like there were always complaints, but now this algorithm had dramatically shifted, not just an individual one, right? So an individual human who might have been a black box might have made a, some decisions that were biased and you could contest those, but the systematic shift created um, almost 10 times as many complaints that they had to deal with at legal aid. So they brought a lawsuit and the lawsuit um, was based on a number of different kinds of issues around notice and due process and you know unfair treatment and not following the regulations and things like that. Um, but the state basically said, we don't know the answers to almost any of this. They fought it on a trade secret proprietary kind of question. They fought it on a bunch of questions. Eventually the judge did order the code to be handed over. But of course this goes to the other point that I think Jenna and others have made in this field about just getting the code may not tell you everything you need to know, um, it, especially because a lot of this is in how it's implemented. And so it's not just how it's trained, but like the actual configuration of the systems and the interaction of the systems with other things and the modification of the systems over time. Um, and none of that information, none of that know-how that often comes along with the code as a trade secret was included. So Kevin, the lawyer, just happened to be that kind of guy who sat down and the code was not like crazy complicated and he started to identify what the variables were and he started to match them and he figured out that cerebral palsy had been miscoded and that there were a lot of other problems. And so they ended up winning the case. Um, and, but the question is then, then what, right? So then you win this case. So the hours came back for the certain clients, but what does the state do? It goes out and just gets a new system, right? That's the idea, we'll just go get another proprietary algorithm. We'll go get it, or we'll ask the same vendor likely to just come and recode it in some way and then we'll see. And there's no like true transparency about the new system or the difference. We also heard from the uh, ACLU of Idaho who had brought a similar style case um, around Medicaid benefits as well and had sort of similar questions come up and similar litigation come up. And this is all in the litigating algorithms report, by the way. We produced a report, it's all in there. If you wanna read it, we can talk more about it. And again, one of the things that happened is after the judge ruled for them, the ACLU, and found that the system was unconstitutionally implemented, in part because of notice problems, but in part because of the, the failure to kind of really code in the true assessment criteria and everything else, there's this question of, well, what is the remedy you're looking for? And as a litigator, I'm a litigator, right? I always think about the remedy I want. And the state's response was, well, we just won't do anything. And the judge is like, no, you have to do something. And they're like, well, I guess we'll just go get a new system. Right, so this kind of issue kind of doesn't get resolved necessarily yet in these cases. Um, but I think the ACLU and, and Legal Aid are working on it. So I hope they come up with a good settlement uh, response. Um, okay, next slide. Oops, or maybe, no. Oh, failure. Ah, excellent. Um, okay, so the second case study, I'm just gonna go through three of them, there are five in the, in the report. Um, was, this is one of my favorite cases, in part because the lead plaintiff lawyer, Martha Owen, was just like amazing and salt at the earth and everything else. This is the Houston uh, Federation of Teachers versus the Houston Independent School District. Um, and it was a case where, um, you know, the, the, the testing, using student test scores to evaluate teacher performance is nothing new. It's been contested in many states, including here in New York, where it was ruled to be illegal uh, to use certain criteria as well. But this was really the first case in the country that we could find that where it was implemented in proprietary, third party proprietary software. And that that was the issue the teachers were fighting. Um, so what happened was that the Houston Independent School District said, okay, we're gonna hire, fire, and promote, and deny you, you know, various benefits based on how, we, how your numbers are. And then what they did is they just shipped it off to a software company in San Francisco called SAS. Many of you are probably familiar with SAS. They make a lot of algorithmic software, not just this one. And they would ship off the numbers and back would come a list of what to do with whom and recommendations. And so the teachers union sued saying this is completely unfair because in fact they had some data that showed that certain teachers got huge bonuses one year and then were terminated the next and like it was all over the map. So it looks super arbitrary and capricious. Um, and uh, when they, sued initially, they sued the, the school district, and they said, well, give us all the information. The school district said, actually, we don't even have it. 
Like we couldn't explain it to you because we don't know anything. So it's this kind of like ignorance that also was an aspect of who the defendant in this case was, right? Everything, it's not just that the algorithm's secret or something else, but like even just the actual understanding of how the numbers and the algorithm and everything work, they, you know, much like software vendors sometimes do, they're like, well, we don't care. It's not part of what we do. It's like we've outsourced it here. And so of course they said, okay, well, then we need access to all this third party vendor material. And SAS came back and said, no, it's all trade secrecy. You can't see any of it. So they fought that out for a bit. And um, they ended up in an interesting situation where SAS kept saying it's trade secrecy. Um, they did eventually allow one of the experts for the teachers union to, um, even though he like signed all the protective orders and agreed not to disclose anything and everything else, and he's like an expert in the field with two PhDs and everything, they said the only, the, anyone who's litigated trade secrecies knows what this is like. So the only way you can see our code, because we're so concerned about it, is if you come to our offices and we'll bring a laptop and we'll put it in, on a desk and you have to sit on the other side of the desk with a pen and paper. And you get eight hours and you, you can click keys to click through the code, but you can't record anything electronically. You can't leave, bring your phone in, anything like that. And so, you know, he, he did it. But what ended up being interesting about the case is, so when they went, so, so the school district moved to dismiss the case. And the, this is why I like the lawyer strategy here. The teacher's lawyer said, this is a violation of our constitutional right to procedural due process. Not only did we not get notice of it, but we're being denied the evidence to litigate it now for rights that are about life, liberty, and, the, you know, and, and property, like our, our livelihood here. And the decision, which was a magistrate um, uh, decision out of Texas, uh, really frame this as trade secrets versus the 14th Amendment. And when you know a judge frames it that way, you know who's going to win, right? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, but in this case, it was true. Uh, that the 14th Amendment, it, so the judge basically said, so what, we, what I have to do is since I'm not going to disclose the trade secrets, I'm not going to force that out in the open, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the policy using this proprietary software, software is unconstitutional as a matter of a constitutional right of procedural due process. Um, so it's a victory, and what happened is they settled the case soon thereafter. Interesting enough, the chancellor of the Houston School District is now our chancellor here in New York City. So our new chancellor is the same chancellor who, his signature is actually on the settlement agreement, which I think is sort of interesting. Um, and it tells us a lot about how due process and trade secrecy are interacting in this context, and that in some ways the due process lever kind of forces uh, the government agency and the proprietary vendor to be at odds to some degree. I mean, maybe the agency doesn't care that much, but like the agency loses in this situation when the vendor won't disclose. If the vendor discloses, maybe the agency doesn't lose, but that's not what the vendor wants. And in fact, the judge specifically said that not only do, can, is there no way for the teachers to understand how decisions about their life were made, but the school district can't even dis understand how decisions, they can't verify, they can't do anything um, and, it, you know, and said that even the plaintiff, and so what in the other, the other thing the judge cited was that the plaintiff's expert, the one who sat down for the eight hours with the pen and paper said that even he couldn't understand it in that context, that he would need more access to training data code, context, everything else. So again, the restrictions put in place by the protective order because of the trade secrecy ended up in some sense supporting the win for the plaintiffs here. And I think that's a strategy that we uh, see over and over again in these kind of cases and one that I think can be employed to force this issue more out into the open. Um, okay, next slide. Um, okay. Um, so the third one I'm gonna talk about uh, is a case out of the uh, Federal Public Defender's Office of DC. Um, and uh, I, I, there have been other challenges to criminal risk assessments and obviously uh, in criminal law, we're seeing a lot of this with the probabilistic genotyping, a lot of challenges that we've hear, heard about. So this is not the only one. But what I find interesting about this is kind of how it played out and the other kind of legal strategies. So how many of you are familiar with savory or savory? I'm never sure how to say it. Has anyone heard of this before? Okay, yeah. Right. So the, a lot of these risk assessments in particular are focused on the risk of violence. And I've actually just for fun, been running a search on Lexis for risk assessment to see like what cases keep coming up. Obviously, so the most common, they come up almost every day. There's always a risk assessment case every day on LexisNexis um, in some court decision. Um, majority of them are about sex offenders and the risk of reoffending there, but they're all over the place. Employment, um, housing, you name it. And so it's just kind of like 
an interesting metric, like how often are courts deciding anything to do with risk assessment. This one is about youth and about um, assessing their future potential for violence. Um, what happened in this case was there was uh, a juvenile, and it was in the juvenile section of the criminal courts, uh, who had uh, admitted to committing a crime. And this was a question of whether they should be allowed to be on probation or sent to a facility, either a mental health facility or to prison. And in, so it's essentially a sentencing type situation that they were in. Um, and the entire, in fact, it was mandatory that, that the juvenile be assessed under this risk assessment and it comes back with one of those, you know, high, medium, or low, high, moderate, or low risk, right? And the judge sees a high risk and says, oh my God, okay, I can't let this person stay out on probation, um, which has all these effects on whether they can have a job or go to college or do any of these things. I must do something about it. And it was challenged by the public defenders. And the way they challenged it was actually digging into the risk assessment itself. Um, next slide. And What's interesting about this is that this risk assessment is actually proprietary in a certain way. Uh, it's sold, and, and for any of you familiar with social science, this is a very common practice. When people create these tests, they claim them as intellectual property, right? They say that you have to buy it, you can't copy it. I mean, we do this with our textbooks, but it's the same idea, right? And it costs you money. Uh, next slide. And in fact, it comes with, I went, this is all off the website, I just screenshot sh the website, right? Like, you buy these things, and in it, it, you know, it binds you in certain ways, in theory, to not sharing the kind of inner workings, like the Rorschach test, all this other kind of stuff, right? And um, the idea, when, so in, when the public defenders tried to get access to, like, the test questions and, like, the criteria and everything else, the first response, which was interesting, was that the, the makers of the test said, we can't do it because it's unethical for us to release the questions, right? because it would allow people to game the system and all these other things that we've heard on occasion, like they'll, they'll find ways to hack or work around the system and the, then the test won't be valid anymore, right? Well, the judge didn't have any of that, which was good. Said, well, I don't care, whatever. This is in a court of proceeding here. They're not gonna publish it online. Um, would have been interesting if they had. Um, and so you have to turn it over there. And then they said, oh no, we have this proprietary confidential interest. And the judge said, no, now you really have to turn it over. So finally the judge did order Again, we're seeing a pattern here of judges finally getting it. You have to order the stuff turned over in litigation, right? As opposed to FOIA and other things where there are problems. And of course it turned out that there were huge racial biases in this. For example, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the criteria is called uh, parental criminality. So it means if your parents have any kind of connection to criminal histories, well, as we know from the statistics around stop and frisk and over policing, and the kind of race issues in this country, which should be surprised no one, the idea that if you're a person of color and your parent is a person of color, that they might have had a criminal history is gonna be a lot higher, right? The other thing, uh, the other criteria I found particularly disturbing was community disorganization. This means is there a lot of crime or unrest in your community, right? Is there a lot of gang activity or other kinds of issues? And again, we know from certain kinds of policing strategies around public housing or other kinds of, uh, predictive policing strategies, that these can have really disparate impacts, right? So this starts coming out. Um, but also that it turned out that, the, te that the, the savory model had actually been around for like 20 years, but had only been validated by one peer-reviewed uh, uh, article. It was actually like, the other one was like an unpublished master's thesis. And that by the, by the time they were able to get all this information about the model, um, you know, that they were able to challenge it. And they challenge it under the Daubert Fry standards for what is testimony or scientific evidence that can be brought in the court, and they won. So there's a published decision saying that this model failed uh, under the test to be admissible. Um, uh, even though, uh, it, so there's a lot more discretion in, the, in these kind of sentencing hearings. It isn't a technical Daubert motion because that's more for evidence in trial. But the judge basically took the discretion to adopt that kind of approach. And even though this technically wasn't part of software, it had some of the same similar issues I think you would see in these uh, algorithmic systems. Uh, all right, so I'll finish up. So next slide. Uh, so to, just want to end on a couple of different things about possible pass forward. We're going to have a lot of conversation about this today. I'm excited about it. Um, I think these further procedural due process challenges are going to keep coming, and especially now that we have some precedent, I think they can be incredibly effective, so I would like to support and encourage that, and my clinic is happy to be uh, part of that if anyone needs to team up. Um, 
But also, I think um, model protective orders would be useful, some, some real thinking about what is the right kind of protective order, because the protective orders that we've seen have traditionally been kind of commercial trade secrecy kind of litigation. Um, uh, we've seen some other protective orders in criminal cases, but I think we might want to all get on the same page about what the, those things are and some of the work about identifying ahead of time, like Jenna's article with EFF, like what do we really want, how are we really going to get it, um, would be very, very helpful. Um, and then, uh, this is a plug, but with AI Now, we put out um, uh, a framework for government agencies, and this relates to like how they procure these things about the ways to try to assess this. I mean, Andrew Selfs has done a ton of work on this in the policing context. Other people have looked at this in privacy impact assessments and environmental impact assessments, and there's a whole literature there that Andrew and, and Salman Barakas and other people have all been a part of. Um, and so it builds, hopefully, a little bit on that, but talks about it specifically in this context about putting it out for notice and comment, maybe having experts identify what will need to be litigated um, so that we can make sure that information is not uh, outside of the control of government, that government can't say, oh, we had no idea, we had to keep all these records, the other kind of thing. Um, and then finally, the last slide um, uh, is model procurement language. And so I think this is really interesting, this idea that the contracts between cities, states, governments, and, other, and the vendors um, we actually, in this algorithmic accountability policy toolkit, have suggested language that we think um, is, uh, is a starter place, at least, where the vendor doesn't say they'll disclose what they won't disclose, but it really says that they'll waive, they'll, essentially it's a non-assertion, they'll waive the right to assert a claim for trade secrecy or CFA or breach of contract or any of the other claims I mentioned uh, for efforts to access the system uh, for accountability purposes or to test for disparate impact or these other kinds of questions. In other words, it's a preemptive move to get them to waive the right to go to court. So if they do eventually try to go to court and assert these things, you're like, you waived it when you made the contract with the city or the state or whatever. So that's the presentation. I look forward to the conversation. Oh, actually, sorry, one last thing. We are going to be doing more litigating algorithms events, uh, including with Canada, the EU, and India. So if you're interested, let me know, because I think there's going to be more out there. Okay, great. Um, so let's have the uh, speakers come up, and we'll spend a few uh, minutes doing Q&A. Um, we won't make this really extended, because we're going to have lots of, this is just the introduction to the whole, um, the whole conference. Um, but I will, um, yeah, let's raise your hands and we'll um, start taking questions. Okay. And, oh, and, and if you can go to the, yeah, if you can go to the microphone, that's helpful because we are, we are recording this. Um, and tell us who you are. Uh, hi, Nicholson Price uh, from the University of Michigan Law School. I guess the, the question that I have is uh, both for Gina and Jason, I think it's a little bit at the intersection. What a process of trying to seek adverse inferences for keeping algorithms secret uh, with respect to demonstrated discrimination, how feasible is that kind of more generally? And, and would that shift the incentives for keeping thing or potentially making algorithms more transparent and kind of uh, improving them over time? Well, I mean, I think this has been an, an interesting issue in trade secrecy law um, uh, in general, which is, you know, what are the, what, how, if the, so, I was actually sharing this with Rochelle. There's a California civil procedure statute that makes it explicitly part of, like, after the complaint and the answer have been filed, if the complaint alleges misappropriation, the trade secret owner has to define the trade secret to some degree, or it can't proceed. In other words, it, there's a punishment if you aren't able to kind of name it. And what's interesting to me from an IP professor point of view is the way that we require notice and de definition in other domains of IP, but in trade secrecy, it's kind of a different way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. Um, and so then the question is, like, at some point, is there a sanction for that? Is there, yeah, some sort of adverse inference? Um, I think, I'm worried that courts will, they're, they're always hesitant to impose those kind of sanctions, I think. Um, I think, especially when it's a third party who is like, we got no dog in this fight, we just sell software kind of thing. I do say that there, some of the um, efforts that have been going on to think about model legislation in the criminal context and changing some of the ways in which criminal courts might rely on these things as evidence if they're not disclosed, I think is, is sort of where I, I see that conversation happening. There's some 
legislation, they're thinking about changing the California evidence law to kind of create different presumptions around evidentiary proof if you can't get access to these. Um, I know Andrea Roth didn't make it here, but her machine testimony article, I think, also does a really great job talking about kind of some of the battles that have gone on around those issues, too. We're forcing people to actually identify what it is that has to be secret. I mean, that. Yeah. You know, and how many secrets, too. This is the other thing. It's like there's not one, like, it's not like the Coke formula where it's like one super secret. I think these systems, you could, they would claim many secrets, right? And right. so even just knowing, mapping, like, what do they think is secret and proprietary right. and what do they think right. is not? Because, again, like, in, in trade secrecy litigation, right, um, the best thing to do is to show it's already out there, right? Like, if they, oh, they, they, this formula is totally secret, and you're like, yeah, it's on Wikipedia, so what are you going to do next, right? Um, but you can't do that until you know exactly what they're talking about um, and you know, show, that, show how close or how thin that difference is, right? And if you, I think asking them to prove potential harm from disclosure um, when there's already such substantial first mover advantages and you know, to say really what would the harm to you be if this came out. And another thing, if you are producing software for the criminal justice system or public applications, it should be, disclosure should be part of your business model. Like it is absolutely crazy to say after the fact, oh I had no idea I would have to explain this decision or, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so maybe people who have questions can just wander over to the microphone and that'll um, expedite the efficiency of the uh, Let me just add, though, that th this, I want to bring back in the incentive point that uh, a number of you are raising, right? I mean, I think the other thing is that we have very little data on how this might affect incentives. I mean, my assumption, no one will be surprised, is that I think people will sell government software. Uh, even if well, they have yeah. to do these and disclosures I, yeah, yeah. for so, accountability yeah, that, that's purposes. Why, that's why what you said was interesting. Yeah. You have them waive trade secrecy in the contract, and then we'll start saying. I'm sure Are someone else will sell, right? right? But there is, a, there is pushback, though, there to say we won't get the yeah. best software, right? Yeah, we right. won't get well, the best software. Well, we'll, uh, really interesting data. Yeah, right? exactly. And especially in a world where they are not investing in iterative improvement, they're just playing yeah. a shell game. Oh, you don't like this one? You made me disclose this one? I'll get a whole new one, <laughs> and we'll start this all over again. You know, if you're worried about getting the best software, well, you know, how about you work on making the software you, yeah. you have better and putting incentives to Sorry. do that? One, one specific data point on that, just to add, um, in the Arkansas case, um, there was evidence that even the model that they ha had had been trained in another state. And they had just taken the model from the, the vendor had just taken the model they'd already done the work for in the other state um, and said, oh, we'll just take your data and we'll just plug it into the old, like, Idaho or Iowa's model, and that's your new algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even customized in any way. Or earthquake models for predictive right. policing, you know, like. <laughs> Glenn. Great. I'm a Glenn Cohen from Harvard Law School. So I love all this. I agree with you, but I want to be a little contrarian, a little bit of a gadfly. I think it's helpful. I don't know yeah. if there's anybody on the data the today who's going to be. Right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and that's to say that I find a lot of these discussions uh, kind of are, pr pr uh, uh, are prey to status quo bias in the view of the current decision makers being so great. So you might say the ultimate black box decision maker is actually the human brain, the way we make decisions currently. And that it, the real question to ask is as against what? That it may be that you dislike the way algorithms make decisions, but the question one ought to ask, is it better than the status quo in terms of the distribution of results? And Jason, just to take your example, so the Medicaid example I think is brilliant, it's very motivating, but imagine we flipped it and said we had begun with the state having an algorithm and the algorithm had given her 56 hours. And then we send a nurse and the nurse basically says, well, I've seen a lot of patients like this. I know how patients react. I'm gonna knock you down to 32 hours. Would we have the same view that the nursing was so much better and it's great to have that human decision maker? Or might we be worried that when nurses make determinations and make judgments based on this, it's based on a very limited data set of how does the house look? Do I like the kinds of things she has? Is she a personable person? So just to put a pushback on this is to say we should think about this reversibility a little bit. I think that that is, is a, a super important question. And I think, um, Human decision making is no picnic either. You know, confirmation bias, different decisions before lunch and after lunch, you know, um, it, ad hoc. So specification is great, right? Being able to say, this is the, the thing I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna follow it every time, whether that's software or hardware or you know, a flow chart that people follow, that gives you some hope of auditing and questioning and iterative improvement. Um, but I think, I've been thinking a lot about the proper relationship of human decision makers to machines in the larger system, right? 
A bad use of humans is like mindless rubber stamping. It de-skill, you can say, oh, a human like made the ultimate decision, but really you make that an empty promise. I think a better use for humans is um, really digging and investigating reports of errors, right? And giving them the logs and the transparency and the details that they would need to do so. But at least humans, as bad as they are, um, evolve over time and can consider more information that they weren't built to originally consider. And if we're gonna put these things in black boxes and not allow iterative improvement, we've gotten rid of the best argument for going with automated systems or specifications. And we, 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 software lives a long time. Would you want software that was built in the 50s making societal decisions for us today? Um, there's a lot of software systems that were, that were built decades ago that are still running things. And if we're not careful, that's what we'll get. There will be no incentive for iterative improvement. I'm just going to barge in as the moderator um, because this is something I've actually also thought about and I'm writing a bit about. Um, and, and I think that the, the, the answer to that question, well, it's not like there's one answer, but is um, not to say that human decision making is so great and so free from bias and so on. In fact, absolutely the opposite. We know human decision makers are black boxes. We've known this for a long, long time, and this is why we have a lot of legal procedures that we have put in place to moderate, to audit those decisions, to make them appealable, to make them all of these things. And I, I, my view on it is that we should be using what we've learned over centuries of dealing with human decision makers, not because it works perfectly, but because we've learned some things from that, to think about how we want to audit, modify, um, account, make, enforce accountability for these uh, automated decision makers as well. Not that it will necessarily be the same thing, um, but that these concerns and these sorts of needs and what is important to do, we can learn a lot from um, speaking as a law professor, law and legal theory. <laughs> okay, sorry. I think this is going to be the last question for this session. Hi there. Uh, I'm Daniel Con gilmore from the ACLU. I'm a technologist and not a lawyer. Um, but I, I look at the um, things that are held secret under trade secret uh, because of claims for uh, commercial disadvantage if it, their secret was released. And one of the things that I notice, because a lot of technology is garbage, is that... <laughs> the secrets are also garbage, right? And the reason why there's a commercial disadvantage to releasing them is because it becomes apparent that what you're shipping is garbage. Mm -hmm. And so it is actually a commercial, dis a commercial disadvantage to, for people to be aware <laughs> that you're shipping garbage, yeah. right? Yeah. So is that a, a, uh, how can we address that given that, that trade secrets have this particular constraint, right? That, that, that the reason that I want to keep it a secret is because I'll lose something in the marketplace if it's revealed, and what I'll lose is standing and reputation, which are actually valuable assets. So, I mean, I, I want to push back against trade secrets, but I, but I you know, this, this, like, it's true, it looks bad to see what is actually under the hood most of the time. So how do we address that? I mean, I think all these, all these techniques for thinking about people either have to waive their right to trade secrecy or they have to create ways to um, argue procedural due process. I mean, I actually think the Daubert um, analogy, sort of analogy that you mm -hmm. talked about is really interesting because that's what Daubert was really about. Daubert mm -hmm. was about exposing the expertise that people claim to have um, and actually putting it to the test. Um, you know, judges don't do it very well, but I think that, that, that that's what we're trying to do when we're trying to get trade secrets revealed. Now, on this notion that it's the criticism that you don't want, I, I mean, copyright has that also. So copyright, you, people don't want you to copy their stuff because you're going to put it into an article that says it's crap, you know, that lose, ruins your reputation. That's not considered a good copyright claim. Usually it's fair use to, uh, to put somebody in a bad light based on quotes from their work. Um, critique is something that we value. 
So I think that you know that, that's an interesting um, contribution that we ought to be thinking about that in this context too. It's it's not the usual move people make, but it's a very interesting one. Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to add this to Rochelle to this, but the, this question of what is the independent economic value that's derived from keeping the information secret has been something that's been litigated in the commercial context. But I know we're going to be talking about e-voting later and voting machines, and I think this is another place where that issue really came up. Was like so the secret that we're trying to keep you from learning is that our voting machines don't really work very well and they have lots of problems. Uh, and if we that we would lose a lot of money, and our competitors would then be able to sell better. And yes, yeah. I think that that's a brilliant way to to phrase what's going on. I had been framing it as um, they're using those protections to hold off legitimate criticism rather than to defend commercial interests. But you're actually right that they have a commercial interest in um, not preventing people from stealing their garbage, but revealing that it was garbage in the first place. And I think what that really says is we need incentives for the public good and individual rights that are just not even being talked about in this conversation. If what we're talking about is the rights of developers and the rights of deciders, and we don't even have a way to talk about the rights of individuals or the rights or, or societal good, then we're gonna get exactly that. Yes, that's in the interest of the developers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually also bar, barge in again, and, and then I'll make myself the last person to talk. Um, because, I think, yeah, because I think one of the important things about this from an IP pers perspective, and this is reiterating a little bit of what Rochelle already said, is that from a point of view of IP theory, um, this is clearly not okay, right? You can't say I have a, it, it's, a, it's my commercial advantage to have you know that my, my thing doesn't work. That would, no one would succeed on making that claim. The problem is that with trade secrecy, it's hard to know whether that's the claim that's being made. And I also think that there's something that's changed about trade secrecy and what is a trade secret. When you start having data being kind of the very important and what's the main trade secret. It's that previously when we were talking about a chemical or something like that, you have a, chance, you have a possibility of reverse engineering it you have a possibility of testing it. You have lots of ways to limit the trade secret. Um, and reverse engineering, totally OK. Independent invention, totally all right. We don't have right now, I think, appropriate limitations on trade secrecy for our current te technology. And I think that's, uh, my personal think that's true not only in this context, but sort of more broadly. Uh, like we try to have in other areas of IP, not, not necessarily successfully, but. Yeah, but the, the incentives that Gina mentioned is also true in patents. It's, it's very hard to have public incentives to challenge a patent. Yep. So this is you know, not a brand new problem, um, although it's an important problem. So you didn't speak last. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll take a break now and um, come back.